Hey, welcome to another Buy 100 lecture. We're going to start off today by talking about species. And I want you to take a look at this box of, of butterflies. And I want you to hit the pause button and identify as many species in this box as you think you can see. Ready, go. Okay, hopefully you took the time to do that. Um, it's pretty essential that you did as it's gonna help develop a little bit what we did in our lecture today. But let's, uh, let's keep moving forward. Okay, so what's in a species name? Well, the primary category in the Linnaean classification scheme is, uh, is a species. But before you can get the species, you have all the other uh, classification ranks within the Linnaean classification scheme. And these are domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And in some cases, uh, we even go as low as subspecies. But the ones in red are the only official ranks in the Linnaean classification scheme. Uh, so if you want to kind of help remember the order of this, uh, I remember it by, by this um, moniker that was given to me a long time ago. The kings play chess on fine grain sand. Okay, and uh, there's another one is deplete. The kings play chess on fine golden stools. Uh, things like that. Anyway, just whatever it takes to help you remember the order of these different ranks. How many names do, do species have? Well, they are binomial meaning two. So the first is the genus name and the second is what we call the species epithet. So genus is capitalized and the species epithet is lowercase. Both are italicized or underlined. So it can be like us, homo sapiens, like this, capital, uh, lowercase, italicized, or homo sapiens, under, uh, underlined. Um, so here's an example that's, that's often pretty interesting for, for students, okay? So these are different species. This is your dog, Canis familiaris, okay? And then we have Canis lupus. So they're both in the same genus, Canis, because they're both dogs, okay? Um, but lupus is the wolf, familiaris is your pet at home. Um, species are morphologically distinct. So members of a species generally look alike. Um, so here's an example. You have bald eagles um, that can be found from Alaska all the way down to, um, to Florida and parts of Mexico. Um, all bald eagles look essentially the same. And by the way, I should note, uh, you can start to see bald eagles now in the state of Utah if you get out into the, some of the more rural areas as Utah is a fantastic overwintering ground for some of these large predatory birds. Okay, here's another example. The, uh, the cougar, puma concolor, uh, mountain lion. We have a lot of several different names for them, puma as well. Um, they, they live clear up into uh, Canada and all the way down to the very tip of, uh, of South America, or at least they did. There are, right now, a lot of the populations are extinct or severely reduced, um, but they do live all throughout these regions. So, what to you is a species? I want you to think about that for a second. How would you define a species? Okay. Well, we have several different species concepts, and the one that you are probably thinking of right now in your mind is the biological species concept. And this is a definition that a group of populations that can interbreed are the same species. Um, reproductively isolated from other groups, meaning that, um, that they cannot interbreed with other, with other species. Um, this is not the same as geographical isolation, right? I mean, species could still interbreed if they came into contact, so they would still be considered the same species by definition of the Biological Species Act, um, or Biological Species Concept, excuse me. Um, but they, you know, they just don't because they're ge geographically isolated. 
But there are limitations to the biological species concept, right? What do you do with fossils? This fossil dragonfly right here that we're looking at is actually as good as any dragonfly I could go capture out in the wild today. The, the morphology here, the, the anatomy on this dragonfly is exceptional. But I couldn't do anything with it or prove that it's a new species because I can't get a fossil to breed with another fossil. There's no record of reproduction here. And there's also asexual reproductions. This is bacteria, insects, and some lizards, fish, others um, reproduce without, um, without mating. So how do you figure out what's a species there? Uh, here are some examples of others that can reproduce without mating. Yes, those are Komodo dragons. Pretty fantastic. Uh, what about hybrids as well? What about species that are that are unique, but clearly hybridize? Uh, this could also be like um, ligers, right? So a liger is a cross between a lion and a tiger. Uh, clearly two separate species, but when they mate and produce ligers, they're actually completely fertile. Uh, offspring able to pass on their genetics and you could actually take a liger and pass it back to a tiger and create a tigon or back to a lion and create a ligon so they're fully interfertile um, in any way you look at it but are they their own species so then this brings us up to this question well if the biological species concept isn't so great for fossils and other things then how do we identify a species well that's a really good question uh, and we are going to explore this by using this example right here. So here's this uh, opportunity to learn about different types of species concepts. Okay, So what we're going to do is we're going to look at frog populations and we're going to decide how to separate them into distinct species using different species concepts. Okay, So if we take a look at these, you've got the morphological species, the biological species concept that we just talked about, and then we have the phylogenetic species concept. So the morphological, or in this case, they're calling it the morpho species concept. It's really based on, um, on the similarity of their morphology or their anatomy. Okay, Things like size of bones and structures, color, etc. Um, and the weaknesses that some populations can actually have different species within that look very very similar biological species concept we've been over this and the phylogenetic the phylogenetic species concept um, is really that you can it can be used on all species whether they're fossilly sexual sexual species um, and and then one of the major weaknesses is um, good phylogenies are not always available okay so you can review these a little bit more on your own but let's go ahead and jump in here. Okay, so you're on this island um, and you have these frog populations. Okay, so you're gonna play the role of a museum curator, which is something I do part of the time. Um, and you have to, you just got these samples of 100 frogs from each of five populations, so 500 frogs total from Hunt Island. The map shows you the geographic range of each of the frog populations labeled A through E. So now we need to just, we need to figure out, are these all one species? Are there different species on this island? How does this work? Okay, so when you look at this, you have species, you have population A, B, E, D, and C. And this is, this is applying the morpho species concept. Remember, this is based on morphology or anatomy. And one of the things they're looking at here is the snout to vent leg ratio. So they measure from the tip of the leg to the base of the leg and then from the snout to the vent. And then you can create a ratio there. And that helps you to determine how many different species there might be here. So when we look at this ratio on this graph, we see that these two kind of overlap. These two somewhat overlap. There's a little bit of overlap here, not so much there. So I want you to just take a second and tell me how you might lump um, these groupings here into species groups. Okay, so generally when I've taught this in the past, some of my students have said, okay, we're going to do A and E. We're going to do B 
and D, and then we're gonna say, no, we're gonna say D is its own thing, and we're gonna put C right here. And we're gonna say submit. Okay. Um, and then you can go ahead and read through this, right? So morphological traits, often good indicators of a species. But go ahead and definitely hit the pause button, read all through this so you can understand it. Okay, so here's the next one. So now we're going to do the biological species concept. So here, we can't necessarily mate these frogs, right? Because they are not in, um, they're not alive, they're not in the lab, we're not in the field with them. But what we do have is we have the recorded call of each one of these populations. And if you know anything about the call of frogs, call frog calls are very specific to the species um, that, uh, to each species, meaning that females won't mate with males whose frog whose call is not similar to their to what they prefer. So let's go ahead and listen to some of these. Let's listen to that one again. Okay, so that's population A. Population E, do you hear any difference there? Okay, here's population B. Population D. Population C. So these two sound pretty similar. Okay, so I'm going to take A, E, B, C, and D. Okay, so you can kind of look at this, um, read through this. This is really important for you to kind of do these comparative questions and things like that. So hit the pause button, read through them, do the comparison. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do is the phylogenetic species concept. So in this case, you have, some, you have a small chunk of mitochondrial DNA that you're going to use to make a phylogeny. And this is the result that you get when you do that, right? So you find that A and E are closely related populations, C and B are closely related populations, and then D is kind of out here on its own. So you just grab these. They've kind of done it for us because it's in a phylogeny. This is why people like the phylogenetic species concept because it provides the groupings for you that are based on evolutionary relationships. Okay, so we can hit, put that together. Okay, so these are correct, right? This is what we get. So when we look at, and I want you to make sure that you're reading through each and every one of these. Okay, so hit the pause button, read through that. So when we look at those three different types, we kind of had, we, we come up with this idea that we have one species here, we have another species here, and we have a, a third species here. So how in the world did this happen, right? You'd think that C and D would be more closely related than B and C, right? Or that maybe even these three would be more closely related um, to each other than either one of these, but that's not the case. So here's kind of how this might have happened, right? So originally you have Hunt Island, this one large population. Then over time, there could have been some sort of water that split the island, separates the frog populations this way. Okay, we have another event that comes in, uh, forcing, forcing them to go further apart over time. And then this land comes back together. Okay, but in coming back together, what you have here is that you have this genetic separation of the lower population. Okay. And this genetic separation could be something like preferred frog calls. Maybe this portion of the population prefers one type of frog call than this portion of the population. Okay. And then you can see here that they actually, uh, that you get this, you get another geographic formation that comes here, splitting these populations apart. Okay. And then the last bit here, over time, these populations differentiate from each other, forming, uh, forming closely related uh, populations but that have been separated by a geographical barrier, just like the water that at one point cut through the middle of the, of the island. So spend some time working on that. Um, you can follow the link uh, in the slides or, um, yeah, and come back and just kind of run through this until it all makes sense for you. All right, so why? So we kind of talked a little bit about using different species concepts to identify different species. So why might determining what a species is even be important? 
So there are, there are actually a good amount of reasons to understand this. It helps us in things like medicine. Understanding the speciation process in medicine has actually given insight into things even as remote and, and seemingly unrelated as cancer. Um, you can understand the ecology around you better, um, which would allow you to preserve eco eco ecological relationships, which give us free um, things as human beings, um, such as clean water, um, well-functioning ecosystems provide us things like the opportunity to, to harvest um, natural resources for our own use and to do it in a sustainable way that doesn't uh, hurt the planet, but also gives us free things. We don't have to pay uh, for these for these natural resources that happen around us. Okay, so con conservation of endangered species, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, okay, so I want to come back to this before we dive further into species. And I want you to take a second, now that we've mastered what three different species concepts and how to identify species, I want you to look at this and, f and again, reassess all of your species groupings that you did previously. So hit the pause button and go for it. Okay, so this is the answer, believe it or not. These are all one species here, another species group here, and this is a species group, species group, species group, okay? So just kind of to show you that sometimes, you know, you have two individuals like this where you think, oh yeah, those are definitely the same species. This guy actually looks different. But in reality, you have a male and a female here, and this is a male from another species. So super interesting to look at this and figure out where the different species groups are. Okay, so species and genetics. Um, genetics can help us determine what is a species and where it came from and how did, and when did it get there as well. So looking specifically at crayfish. So crayfish are an interesting, interesting group and they get a lot of focus because about 50% of their species are either presumed extinct, critically imperiled, imperiled, or vulnerable. And when we look at this, oh, I guess the other thing I should point out here before we move on is that if you look at a lot of highly endangered um, plant and animal groups in the United States uh, and North America, basically, a lot of them are associated with fresh water, which is really interesting to think about. But fresh water is, is a extremely valuable resource. It's something that we use to drink, obviously, but to grow crops and do a lot of things with. As a result, a lot of uh, insect species and plant species and just animal species overall that associate with fresh water uh, or need a good amount of fresh water uh, obviously uh, have become imperiled in some way or vulnerable. Okay, but turning back to crayfish. So you have to ask yourself, what is the unit that we want to conserve? So if we're doing conservation of animals, do we want to conserve a population, a species, or both, and these are hard questions because sometimes populations can be remnant populations that are very, very far away from uh, from the rest of the population. So do we try and conserve that one population or do we say, no, it's good enough to have this larger population further away, right? It's, it's complex. So what is the historical versus current population structure? You wanna understand this if you're gonna make a decision on, on saving a population or a species or both. And our species on the decline, right? Is anything on decline? Is the species overall in decline? Are there other species around it that are, that are in decline? And what is the endangered status? So all of this is something that you try and answer when you go to do conservation of a species. So these are crayfish in Appalachia. These, these crayfish live in underground aquifers and caves. Um, and you can see that they've lost their pigment. You don't see any eyes there either. The eyes are absent. Um, generally speaking, their, their appendages and tenny are much longer, right? So they lose vision, but they extend um, their appendages to be more sensitive to the area around them. So in the southern Appalachian area, you have two species. You have Camberus hemulatus and Camberus jonesi. And these are the distribution of both of these species here. But you have some Cambera species that pop down here. Um, uh, sorry, some Hamulatus species that pop down here and then some Jones eye species that are even clear out here. But generally speaking, 
Um, they're very clear, distinct populations in terms of distribution. Now, one of the things I'll point out here is these little black dots inside. These are museum specimens. Um, so this, these are species of Hamulatus, and these open dots are ones that were collected recently, and these dark, dark dots in the middle uh, here are represent species that were collected from museums. So what we can do is we can take these individuals and we can extract DNA from them and we can use that DNA to create, uh, to look at a population and try and figure out how distributed they are, um, whether they are the same species, what their conservation status might be. And one of the things we find here is that when we do this phylogeny, we actually see that Camberus hamulatus forms this very nice clade with lots of genetic diversity, and uh, Camberus jones eye forms a similar clade, but maybe with less genetic diversity. So essentially, when you see these branches right here that don't have any shape, or they kind of look like a toothbrush, there's very little genetic diversity there. So, um, so that even though they form a very nice clay, the genetic diversity is limited. So that may mean that when we look at conserving both of these, we may want to focus more on Jones eye than we do on Hamulatus, which looks like it has a lot of good genetic diversity in it, and it's a very large group. Okay, but this is what's the take home from this is really interesting though. That although Jones Eye and Hamulatus look like the populations are fairly healthy um, and that th those species probably do not need conservation, because we had museum specimens, so here's a museum specimen, museum specimen, museum specimen, and here's some other museum specimens mixed in with this individual that is recently collected, because we, we did that, we actually see that some of the original population are different species that have yet to be described. And these are species that look like Jones Eye or Hamulatus but genetically, they appear to be very different. So it's, it's likely that the conservation of these, uh, of we thought we were going to be doing conservation in Jones Eye, um, but it's very likely that we should be doing conservation in these other two uh, genetically unique species, what appear to be species. And the beauty of that is, is we found it all out because of museums. So museums are major repositories of biological diversity. So here are some birds at the Smithsonian, uh, incredibly beautiful collection, not only helpful, but, um, but important because these collections are historical repositories that show us what once was some place. And not only that, but there are genetics associated with these sp specimens that we can use. Uh, and ultimately, these museums will show us shifts. They'll show us when, sp when species go extinct, They'll show us why species may, gone, may have gone extinct. They'll show us when new species arrive, right? That they weren't present there before traditionally, but they are there now. Um, and it's not just birds we do this for. We do it for fishes, reptiles, insects. BYU actually has massive collections of animals. Uh, BYU has probably the largest insect collection in the Great Basin. Um, their co the collection overall is extremely important. Um, in, uh, in the Intermountain West. So another example here, these are kind of the utility of museums. So again, we have uh, P. ferruginous and P. liberorum. Their ferruginous is thought to be very limited and in need of a great deal of conservation. Um, but when you, do an, when you do a phylogenetic analysis, what you find is when you include the museum specimens of ferruginous here, shown in green, um, you find out right away that P. liberorum and ferruginous are actually the same species. They just have some color differences or whatever it may be, but they're the same species, so there's actually no need to do any conservation here again, which saves millions of dollars. Um, and, and all of this was brought about because we had museums. So those museums saved us millions of dollars in unneeded conservation that probably would have happened uh, had... We not had we not been able to pull museum specimens and look at the genetics of ferruginous. But what another thing that was really interesting here is that there were actually three other species that came by, that came as a result of looking at the genetics of liverworm and ferruginous. And here we have where those other uh, species are that that are almost certainly in need of conservation at some level. So even if you know or originally we thought we didn't have to do any conservation, we could save millions of dollars on this, but luckily we know we don't. So some of that money, if not all of that money, could be shifted towards the conservation status of these three species if desired. 
Okay, so how do species originate? We talked a lot about what is a species, how to identify a species, but how do they originate? So when one species splits from two species, you're going to get it. Um, this is the result of reproductive isolation and evolution. So it could be geographic isolation, like on Hunt Island, right, where the water came through or the mountain range rose up in the middle. There could be behavioral isolation. So this could be something like the frog call, right, that frogs have a very specific call that they enjoy and females will not mate with males that don't have the proper call. Uh, and then uh, morphological as well, right? So there could be morphological differences that don't allow for species to interbreed. Uh, this could also be a secondary consequence of the, uh, of the evolution of population. So sometimes uh, animals can actually, animals and plants can actually breed per se that, um, that, they, can, that they can mate or pass uh, genetics between each other, but because, because they've evolved separately, um, no embryos will be formed. No offspring will come of the mating. All right, so there's two major ways that species can speciate. We have what we call allopatric speciation, where you have the original population and there is some sort of barrier that's formed here, like a mountain range, water splitting an island like we've seen. Um, and then, uh, then they they be, they, ought, they evolve in isolation. The genetics differ, and then when they come back together, they're a distinct species. They actually can't interbreed anymore, or don't interbreed for whatever reason, uh, and they remain two separate species. The other one is called sympatric speciation. So this is when they speciate like together, right? Combined sim. So here's the original population. There's some sort of polymorphism that occurs. So this could be like a frog call. Uh, this could be color. This could be all sorts of different things, but a polymorphism occurs. Um, and then within that population, there are individuals that prefer that polymorphism. And then over time, you have both populations, um, both species essentially, living together with each other, but not interbreeding um, and being morphologically di distinct, um, color distinct, behaviorally distinct, whatever it might be. Okay, so here are some examples. So allopatric speciation could be you have this original population of fish here, you have a land bridge that comes in, the fish uh, evolve separately, okay? Then you have the other one where the land bridge never forms, but the fish just naturally speciate um, living between each other or with each other. Okay, so how can how can reproductive, uh, how can selection cause reproductive isolation? What I want you to do is just work your way through, hit the pause button, work your way through this figure and see if it makes sense to you. Okay, hopefully you did that. So here's an example. So fruit flies, they're raised in two, on two different food sources, a food source high in starch, a food source high in maltose or sugar right um, and so these flies they actually prefer to mate with flies raised on the same food source so when you bring them back together you'll find that those flies that were raised on starch are going to breed together and those flies that were raised on maltose are going to breed together and there are very few that will breed uh, starch flies that will breed with maltose or maltose flies that will breed with starch flies so they essentially became reproductively isolated uh, in the lab just over the food source they were given. How could it happen with genetic isolation? Well, there are really cool examples of this. Um, this is a ring species in California, but really is the, uh, along the west coast, you have these salamanders that live all along the west coast, different species that come along. And what happens is you get to the central valley of California, which is generally very dry, not super hospitable, for an organism that needs water, like a salamander. And so what you have is you have a group of salamanders that evolved on the eastern side of the Central Valley, and you have a group of salamanders that evolved along the western side. And what's interesting is when these, populate, when these species come back together, they're no longer able to interbreed with these species here. So what we've actually formed is a ring species, um, species that have evolved differently genetically uh, due to uh, due to geographic differences. <clears throat> not only can they not interbreed, but there are behavioral differences and there are also phylogenetic differences as well, as you can imagine. 
Okay, so this is all due to geographic isolation, what we call allopatric speciation, uh, and this is the example of a ring species. Okay, here's another example of allopatric speciation, but what I'm going to do here is instead of explaining this slide, I'm just going to have you hit the pause button and figure it out on your own. It's pretty self-explanatory. I don't think there's anything um, hard about this. Okay, and then phenotypic variation. So this is uh, another way for that we talked about where species can speciate sympatrically. Okay, so there's no geographic isolation here. You're doing sympatric speciation. It can be like a polymorphism. So these are different panther colors. Now these panthers haven't speciated, but there's the potential for it to lead to that, right? If you can imagine panthers that that enjoy that panthers that only are willing to mate with uh, other dark panthers or golden panthers that are only mate, willing to mate with other golden panthers, right? That there's the possibility that over over time you could have two species, kind of a darker and a golden species. Uh, here's another one, the way that uh, for sympatric speciation, so plants, there's this rapid change in chromosome number, it's called polyploidy, um, and you, where it's where you get more than two sets of chromosomes, so humans, we just have the two sets of chromosomes, right, but plants and other, even other animal groups can have extensive polyploidy where they get many sets of chromosomes, um, and chromosomes generally need to match up in order for um, viable offspring. Um, <clears throat> Animals also can can speciate sympatrically here. There's sexual selection that can be at work due to color, right, or call or things like that. But then also, you, there's an example with these uh, cichlids in Lake Malawi in Africa where they have speciated due to diet. So you have some species that feed on the top on insects, others that feed on other fish, and others that feed on the bottom. Um, but even on the bottom, you have this specialized individual that feeds on snails and mussels and this individual is more of a general feeder and so uh, they have speciated according to their diet as well okay so rates of speciation how fast can things speciate well it can occur in thousands or millions of years it really depends and it has to do with the rate uh, essentially the rate of reproduction in the different organisms so you can imagine this fly this dolicopoted fly right here um, can breed much faster than a whale species, and bacteria can breed faster than either one of these. So the, the possibility to speciate in bacteria is much higher than in the fly or the whale, but the species, uh, but the, the potential to speciate in the flies is much more of a possibility than in the whale, and you actually see this. There are way more species of bacteria than there are of, the, of this type of fly than there are of this group of whales. So here's some implications of adaptation in, spe in speciation. Um, as we understand more what speciation is and how it happens in nature, we have more of the ability to combat disease, things like HIV, bacteria, and as I mentioned, even things like cancer. Uh, we can slow the rate of extinction of species as well. So we've had success stories in the bald eagle, uh, the American alligator, the Florida panther, the grizzly bear, uh, there are many others that maybe you can think of locally um, where you come from where there were um, native endangered species um, that are now that are now that we're slowing the rate of their extinction or even there are success stories and that is where we will end our lecture today hope you guys enjoyed it hope you're having a good um, a good november and uh, we'll see how things go as we wrap up the rest of the semester